Coleman inviting you to join Mrs. Coleman and me for the next half hour when our sponsors, the Brewers of Schlitz Beer, present the Halls of Ivy. If you like good beer, do as millions of people are doing all over the country. Ask for Schlitz, the beer that made Milwaukee famous. Schlitz tastes so good to so many people that it's the largest selling beer in America. It has to be fine to be first. And now, the Halls of Ivy. Welcome again to Ivy, Ivy College, that is, in the town of Ivy, USA. It is spring. The flowers appear on the earth. The time of the singing of birds has come, and the voice of the turtle is heard in our land. Yes, music is in the air of Ivy, too. Victoria Cromwell Hall has been spilling cadenzas like a bird over her coffee. While well, Dr. William Todd Hunter Hall, president of Ivy, though no turtle he, is tuning up with his own do re mi Oh, go on, Toddy. You can make it. I don't want to make it, Vicky. I want to lose it. That, uh, that musical phrase has been haunting me, trailing through my consciousness like a broken garter. Yeah, I know how it is. That's why they say a tune runs through your mind. If it just walked, you would catch up with it and kill it. I believe it's from a current ditty called The Tennessee Waltz. Correct. Jukebox favorite. It is. Well, who am I to set myself up against the popular taste? I've always contended that the popular songs of a nation reflect its current subconscious mood, not its on-the-surface temperament. It's an interesting theory, Doctor. Can you back it up? Certainly. Do you realize that, that 87 and two-thirds percent of our population is subject to the impact of a current popular melody? That of these people, 48 and one-sixth percent do not realize that the mood induced by this certain tune is reflected in their day-to-day -day actions? And that 13.7 percent are so tone deaf that it doesn't matter. <laughs> no. Well, how did you find all that out? And where did you get the statistics? Where any sensible man who embarks upon a ridiculous theory gets them, I made them up. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, yes, yes. You know, any statistic uttered in a loud, firm tone becomes, for the sake of debate, an immediate truth almost never challenged. Particularly if the decimal point is used freely. There's something about a decimal point which seems to indicate the most painstaking research, and few doubting Thomases will be unmannerly enough to question it. We are a nation of efficiency worshippers, and statistics... Where did this start? <laughs> Jukeboxes, folk songs, decimal points, statistics. Like the man on his way to Alcatraz, you can get a long way from home with one sentence. <laughs> A neat observation. Well, thank you, thank you, yes. Did you ever stop to think that 29.4% of my conversation was made up of neat observations? That 169 was composed of complimentary remarks about you, uh, 46.11, ordinary household chatter, and 13.2, pure nonsense. That's a total of 105.61%. <laughs> You must be getting some outside help. <laughs> I give up. Now, let's go back and play the jukebox some more. Epidemic of folk songs. I'll go on from there. Well, I've been toying with the theory, and considering that the debate is merely with myself, I haven't bothered with statistics. Uh, a theory that the current wave of popular music, hillbillies, square dances, waltzes, and reels, is highly significant. It's a reaching back for reassurance. A flight from the harsh possibilities of our atomic future. It's rather sad in a way, but then a lot of folk songs are sad. They reflect the melancholy spirit of a passive resistance to fate. Even the gayer and more sprightly tunes, uh, you know, where, where, where someone is going somewhere with a banjo on his knee. And uh, they're basically sad songs. 
how on earth did I become such an authority on popular music? <laughs> I'm willing to drop the subject, dear. But if Madame Hoffner sings the Tennessee Waltz at her concert tomorrow night, we can start all over again. Well, I rather doubt that she will. Oh, no, we've set a pretty high standard with our Ivy Music Concert Series. Heifetz, Rubenstein, Marian Anderson, Piatigorsky, Madame Hoffner. They had a very impressive list oh, of... Oh, good. Forget Tennessee, here's Mississippi. That'll be Calhoun Gaddy with the eggs. Oh, howdy, folks. Hello, ah, Calhoun. Calhoun. I just come visiting. Come on in. Well, just for a minute or two. I'm kind of rushed this morning, Dr. Hall. What, an early morning class? No, sir. Early morning, why? I was out gathering my eggs this morning about 6 o'clock, and I turned around, and there was Lori, clean up from Sabuca, Mississippi, and looking pretty as a peach tree in the rain. Oh, your wife's here at Ivy? Yes, ma'am. Old Ed Spivy from over in Egypt brought her up. Egypt? That's the town in Chickasaw County. Oh, oh. I hope you'll bring her over to see us while she's here, Calhoun. Well, I sure would like to, Doc, but she's only going to be staying two, three days. Aims to get right back to her church work. <laughs> Lori's got a conscience like a crow-bumped hornet's nest. <laughs> Oh, dear, and tomorrow night's the concert, and Saturday we have an engagement. But we're free tonight, aren't we, William? Oh, yes, yes, we are. Well, why don't you and Glory come over for dinner? Oh, Miss Hall, Glory would be tickled pinker than a pink-eyed pig. <laughs> well, I got the hustle, and I... Oh, by the way, Doc, many happy returns of the day. Well, thank you, but it's not my birthday. Well, sir, this week a friend of yours and mine's going to be 387 years old. What a mutual friend. Oh, of course, William Shakespeare. Yes, yes, it's his anniversary week. And I just feel like congratulating everybody. And sundown, I'm going to close down my bookcase and fire off a salute at 21 times. <laughs> uh, you're right, Calhoun, a tribute is due. He was not of an age, but for all time. As his friend Ben Johnson said, my Shakespeare rise. Thou art a monument within a tomb, and art alive still, while thy book doth live, and we have wits to read and praise to give. 387 years old and still going strong. Just think what them Elizabethans would have done if they'd known about vitamins. <laughs> well, goodbye, folks, and I'll tell Floyd. Such a hall. Oh, oh, Mr. Wellman, I'll see you later, folks. Yeah, we'll celebrate the birthday tonight, Calhoun. Morning, Mr. Wellman. So long, Mr. Wellman. Yeah. Birthday. This evening? This evening? That's what I came to tell you about. This evening. Dinner will be at 7.30. Flat time. Uh, what dinner? A last-minute arrangement. That's why I'm inviting you personally. She wasn't expected until tomorrow morning that she arrived this afternoon. That's why I'm giving you dinner. But, Mr. Wellman... I had some we... difficulty in persuading her. She wanted to, that is, after all, she had to... Uh, however, I did finally convince her that it was the least she could, I mean, we could do. I expect you and Mrs. Hall to be there. Uh, but, Mr. Wellman... What is it, Dr. Hall? <laughs> Uh, and so far, you have neglected to identify the she in your invitation. And furthermore, I'm afraid we have an engagement for this evening. Yeah, Mrs. Gaddy is here from Sabuga, Mississippi. Madam Hoffner is here from Vienna, Austria. <laughs> oh, Madam Hoffner. Oh, then this is to be a semi-official affair. Uh, uh, Victoria, I don't think the Gaddies will mind if we change Did you say plans. Gaddy? Yes. Oh, now, I see. Well... In that case, I'll extend your regrets to Madam Hoffner. I trust you have an enjoyable evening. Goodbye. And I'll be delighted to find my own way out. Yes, but Mr. Wellman, if you wait, I didn't... <laughs> Mr. Wellman's invitations must be made out of bad checks. They really bounce, don't they? Mm. I've never seen one withdrawn with such dexterity. I wonder how one so slight of mind could have mastered such slight of hand. <laughs> I was trying to tell him that we could rearrange our plans. Yeah, he seemed awfully pleased and excused to call it off. And as president of Ivy, you probably should go to that dinner. Yeah, that's what I was about to tell Mr. Wellman. I sometimes feel he doesn't like us. Mm. I've never known anything so magnificently neutral. <laughs> Dr. Hall, Ms. Hall, 
And she's my wife, Lori. Mrs. Gaddy. Oh, I'm so glad to meet you. Come in, Mrs. Gaddy. Come in. Oh, please, just call me Glory. I'll be looking over my shoulder to see who you're talking to. I'm real pleased to meet you. Well, now, here, let me have your coat. Oh, why, what's this, Calhoun? Oh, Miss Hall, Glory's been fussing all the way over here because I brought her guitar. I wanted to sing for you. She is a regular mockingbird. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Little Calhoun, why'd they want to hear me? Because they're folks who can appreciate good things. Now, now sit down, Glory, and tell me, how's the baby? Oh, little Willie's just bright as a starry night in the piney woods, Miss Hall. <laughs> just wait till you sing. Glory brought me the snap. That little bitty old ugly pretty feather on the big gal's lap. <laughs> that is Willie Todd Hunter Gay. Oh, he's a darling. And you know, Charlie, I think he looks like you. Look. Hmm. <laughs> he looks thoughtful. <laughs> Although at that age, they tell me I resemble nothing so much as a wax doll with criminal instincts. <laughs> well, let's all go into dinner. Yes, yes. And afterward, Glory, we'd love to hear you sing, although we have no established policy of making our guests sing for their supper. <laughs> Down to the holler, the boys all follow her. Jeb Jones' daughter with the low neck collar. She can't cook, she can't sew. She roams the woods like a yearling doe. One, two, three, you can follow me. And Jeb Jones' daughter to the sycamore tree. I got a fever in my bones. Feet's full of sand, my head's full of stones. Got a fever in my bones for the no cap daughter of old Jeb Jones. I gotta love her apple pie, I gotta love her sweet and shy, don't need to ask which one is best, take a good look and you know the rest, what can you do with the likes of her, clings to your heart like a thistle down bird, kiss her once, tell her no more, tomorrow comes and you're knocking at her door, ooh, I got a fever in my bones, feet's full of sand, my head's full of stones, got a fever in my bones for the no count daughter of old, yeah, yeah. Thank you. It's just a song. Thank you, Calhoun, for bringing her guitar along tonight. But you never told us your wife was such an artist. Oh, she sings real sweet, don't she, Doc? Which you ought to hear in the kitchen at breakfast time. Oh, five children, Glory, and you can still sing at breakfast. Uh -uh. Well, anyway, I can keep everybody quiet in his home. I learned that from my mama. She always said singing was much better than talking. You never get into any arguments that way. Glory's mama says if you got to pick on something, get a guitar. <laughs> Yeah, she was right, too. Take any four men, no matter what skullduggery they've planned for each other, organize them into a barbershop quartet, and you have some kind of harmony. But with skulls empty of duggery. <laughs> you know, the next time the board of got... Oh, hey, Doc, you got company. Well, that's unexpected. Excuse me, I'll see who it is. <laughs> Good evening, Doc. Uh, I'm in. Mr. Merriweather, come in. Saw your lights on, so I thought I'd be the first to bear tidings of mixed horror and hilarity. <laughs> uh, one if by land, and two if by Wellman. <laughs> well, whatever it is, come in. Oh, I mean, Mr. Merriweather, but nothing could be nice. You know Calhoun Gaddy, don't you? Who doesn't? How are you, Gaddy? Oh, proud as a spotted pup, Mr. Merriweather. I want you to meet my wife, Glory. It's a pleasure, Mrs. Gaddy. Howdy, Mr. Merriweather. Uh, Dr. Hall, you must have known what was going to happen at Wellman's Wingding tonight, and that's why you ducked it. Oh, does anything ever happen at Mr. Wellman's Wingding? Nothing good. Now, just listen. First, there were eggs stuffed with caviar. Uh, pink caviar. <laughs> but it, it was in the middle of the schnitzel a la Holstein that the guest of honor turned a hunter's green and fled from the table. Madam Hoffman? Yep. 
Clarence sent out an emergency call for Hippocrates, Vespasian, Pasteur, Lister, Osler, the Mayo Brothers, and Flossie Nightingale. <laughs> <laughs> Madam Hopkins should have been forewarned about Mr. Wellman's banquets. He has the gastronomic judgment of a nearsighted goat. <laughs> and a very queasy cuisine. That means that uh, this Mr. Wellman don't know his grits from his gravy here before. <laughs> well, now, how about her concert tomorrow night, Mrs. Merriweather? Oh, I guess she'll pull through. Just a touch of domain. What about the rest of the guests? <laughs> Waiting with fear and trembling. I feel as though I'm living on borrowed time. <laughs> well, you, you just sit here and think sweet thoughts. Glory, there's a special favor to Mr. Merriweather. Won't you sing the Rock Candy Mountain? <laughs> Afternoon, and the halls are waiting for the latest bulletin on the state of health of Madame Hopner, the opera singer. I get it, darling. I'm younger than you, you know. Yeah, prettier, too. <laughs> well, some people say. Now, someday you remind me to remove the door, child. It'll save us a lot of steps. Why, Mr. Merriweather? Yes, ma'am. Back again on the slightest pretext. Well, you don't need any. Come on in. <laughs> Uh, hello, Doctor. Have you heard the latest about La Hoffner? Oh, I haven't been able to break through Wellman's wall of silence yet. Well, get this. Wellman, in honest remorse, tried to make amends to his guest and sent her a lavish floral piece this morning. He meant well, that much I concede. Bless his bulletproof little heart. <laughs> Whenever anyone says he meant well, that means he's made a mess of things. Very concisely stated, ma'am. He couldn't have known, but Madame Hoffner has an allergy to gardenias, a violent one. And now her sinuses are so badly affected, she won't be able to sing tonight. That nosegay of his didn't make hers very... <laughs> if you know what I mean. Well, can we postpone the concert a day or two? Oh, there's the rub. She's due back in New York at the Met. If she hasn't recovered by next week, Rudolph Bing may sue us. Or Clarence. Or perhaps we could get a replacement. On such short notice, who could we get? Cardi, do you remember what we were saying about folk songs? Uh-huh. Do you suppose Glory could do it? Glory? Calhoun Gaddy's wife? Uh-huh. Say, I'll go for that, Doc. Do you think she can fill the shoes of a big opera singer? Well, I think she wears a smaller size. But... <laughs> Most singers and artists, too. Yes, certainly. Just to mention, too, John Jacob Niles and Burr Lives can draw 3,500 people into any auditorium in the country. Well, it's certainly okay with me, but what about the Ivy Music Society? Well, that's your department, so you'll make arrangements on that end. And you'd better let Wellman know that you've taken over, but don't tell him it's Calhoun's wife. <laughs> Mention the blue-tailed fly to him, and he'll be waiting with a swatter. <laughs> Well, I don't think Clarence is going to have much to say for a few days. Say, uh, what are we going to call this girl? Well, let's use her maiden name, Glory Golightly. Glory Golightly. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Irreverent as it may sound, I'd say that if Hoffner hadn't lost the power, we'd never have had the glory. <laughs> Calhoun, she's changing her dress in the bedroom. Well, Miss Hall, you should have seen Glory when I told her. She lit up like a camp meet. She's been fussing to wear that there party dress ever since she got it for Aunt Effie's funeral. <laughs> well, oh, there you are, Glory. Oh, you look just plain delicious. It's all right, Miss Hall. It's real sad. Yeah, it's lovely, Glory. Lovely. Uh, 
What do you think, William? Hmm? Me? Oh, uh, yes. Well, I, uh, yes, yes, it is satin. And them bold. <laughs> Nor you as fluffed up as a new busted cotton ball. Now, do you know, Calhoun, I don't think it does justice to glory. Don't you like it, Miss Hall? Well, it's not that. It's just that it takes away from you. I like that dirndl skirt and blouse you wore last night. Well, those are just miraculous clothes. Uh, the simpler the dress, the more appropriate for your folk balance. Just a guitar, a girl, and her song. But, Dr. Hall, you don't want me to sing them old things for all those people. Well, that was my idea. What did you have in mind? Oh, I've been practicing up all afternoon on some real good tunes. I thought I'd begin with Baby, It's Cold Outside. <laughs> Baby, it's... Well, then I could sing La Vie en Rose and, and maybe end with, um, I Love You Truly. Yeah, Glory, eh, if you don't mind the suggestion. I think all those are fine, but they're a little too familiar. I like the songs you sang for us last night, and I'm sure the audience would love them, too. Well, they just hang down here at all. I like them, but they're so old. And everlastingly new, Glory. I've no objection to popular songs, but they march in and march out with the hit parade. Your songs started somewhere beyond memory, and they never die. Oh, Doc's right, Sugarfoot. You know darn well you learned them from your mom, and she learned them from her mom. And she learned them clean back before anybody was born. <laughs> back when the only guitar was a wind through the cap tail. Well, if you all think so, I don't mind. I just thought you wanted me to put on a show. Last night, Glory, you told us that you sing for only one reason. Because you like to. That's the best reason, and that's why your singing makes others happy. Happiness is contagious, and if the virus is ever isolated, it'll probably be music. So, just sing that way tonight, and you'll be a show. <laughs> attention for a moment. I regret to announce that due to an unfortunate sudden illness, Madam Lottie Hupner cannot appear tonight. However, we, we, we are going to hear another artist this evening, a folk singer. All great masters drew deeply from the treasury of folk music. As Vaughan Williams, the great British composer, has put it, at the root of the musical quality of a nation lies the natural music whose simplest and clearest manifestation is the folk song. And where can we look for surer proof that our art is living than in that music which has for generations voiced the spiritual longings of our people? Ladies and gentlemen, I'm proud to present Miss Glory Golightly. Please remember 